Right, so today, Transfiguration of the Lord Sunday. Hope y'all figured that out by now. Right? Yes. Okay, good. So Transfiguration of the Lord Sunday is that Sunday every year where we celebrate the Transfiguration of Jesus. It's recorded in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In all three of those, Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John, goes up onto the mountaintop, and suddenly standing there with him are Moses and Elijah, and in a moment of brilliance, Jesus is transformed into dazzling brightness. And every year, we celebrate Transfiguration of the Lord's Sunday just before the beginning of Lent. The beginning of Lent is the beginning of our time as we journey towards Jerusalem, as we journey towards the cross, which makes sense because in the Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, after the Transfiguration, when they come down off the mountain, that is when Jesus then begins to head towards Jerusalem for the last time for his passion, and ultimately, the resurrection. It's very clear, actually, in the Gospel of Luke. I love what it says in the Gospel of Luke. It says, just a few verses after they come off the mountain, he set his face towards Jerusalem. He set his face towards what is to come. And today, since we follow the narrative lectionary, in the Gospel of John, we have a story about a man who's blind. I don't know. But we're going to try to make some connections there, okay? We're going to try. When you think about transfiguration, uh, transfiguration doesn't just apply, in a general sense, to what happened to Jesus on the mountaintop. In a general sense, transfiguration can be any dramatic or sudden change in appearance, almost like a transformation. For uh, those of you who are geeks like me and are fans of the Lord of the Rings series, think about uh, Gandalf in Fanghorn Forest, when, after he has battled the Balrogs to the depth of nothing, has come back and appears to Merry and Pippin in a blast of dazzling light, so much so that they cannot even recognize him, he becomes no longer Gandalf the Grey, but Gandalf the I can see there's like three of y'all here that get that. Okay, that's fine. Let's try another one. And to be fair, this next, uh, you're definitely not going to get this next one. But to be fair, I did this primarily for my son Camper, and he's not here today. So y'all make sure and tell him that I put this in the sermon, okay? Do we have any uh, fans of Dragon Ball Z? Oh, yes! Amanda is with me. Patrick Morgan, you're with me. Great. So think about the first time... Goku goes Super Saiyan in his battle with Frieza, that epic battle, and suddenly he elevates to a new level. His dark hair turns blonde and his whole body glows. Transfiguration. Transformation. Perhaps we can make the leap to say that when Jesus gives sight to the man who was born blind, his world was transfigured or transform. Perhaps. Like I said, it might be a stretch. But maybe that's our connection to Transfiguration Sunday. Well, whether it is Transfiguration or Transformation, one thing we can say for sure about this text is that there's a lot of tension in this text. <coughs> now, we've been talking about the Gospel of John for a while now, and one of the things that we have mentioned that happens in the Gospel of John is that there is this tension in the Gospel of John. There are these people who John refers to as the Jews or the Pharisees. And we've talked about how it's important to remember that when John is talking about the Jews or the Pharisees, he's not talking about all Jews. He's not even talking about all Pharisees. But he is primarily talking about those Pharisees or those Jews who are the antagonists of Jesus. And that is very clear here in this passage today. John does a lot of talking about the Jews and about the Pharisees. So when we think about that, think the antagonists of Jesus. 
And in fact, these antagonists of Jesus are so powerful or intimidating or such a presence that even at one point, the man who regains his sight, his parents don't even defend him because they are afraid <coughs> of being put out of the synagogue by these antagonists of Jesus. These antagonists of Jesus are not just antagonists of Jesus, but they seem to be antagonists of everything that Jesus touches. They are so opposed to Jesus that the man who has been born blind, who has been given back his sight, tells people, you're not going to believe what happened to me, and no one believed him. He said, no, no, really, this guy, he gave me my sight. No, no, he didn't. No, really, I'm not lying to you. So they take him to the Pharisees, the antagonists of Jesus. And the Pharisees questioned him, and, they, and he says the same thing. They don't believe him. So they ask him again. He says the same thing. It gets to the point that they so much do not want to believe what he is saying that they go and ask his parents, Are you sure this is your son? Wait a minute, are you sure he was really blind before? Are you sure he wasn't just pretending all those years to be blind? They don't want to accept the answer, and so they continue to ask the same question again and again and again because they will not believe what they are hearing. It finally gets to the point that they stop really asking the question, and they start telling the man what they want to hear. It gets to the point where they say, confess, you are a sinner. Jesus is a sinner. Confess. He says, what do you want me to tell you? I was blind. Now I see. And they don't even want to listen to him. Then it gets to the point where they cast him out, put him out of the synagogue. They say to him, you are a disciple of Jesus, we are disciples of Moses, and it says in the text that they revile him. Y'all see a little tension there? Yeah, me too. So, I'm not sure this is a completely perfect metaphor or analogy or parallel or illustration or what have you, but... Bear with me for a minute. Are y'all familiar with the, the, the phrase victim blaming? I think we could say that's happening here. Victim blaming is when the victim of a crime is blamed for that crime. Usually, specifically, and most tragically, it happens in sexual assault or rape cases. When the victim is blamed for being a victim. We like to say, oh, well, you know, if she hadn't been wearing those clothes, if you hadn't been in that place, if you hadn't talked to that guy, this is an incredibly powerful technique that defense attorneys like to use when trying to get their clients off by blaming the victim, by saying it was her fault that this happened to her. That's kind of what's happening here with this blind man. You know, he didn't ask to be healed. If you look back at the scripture, it's not there. Not only did he not ask to be healed, he also didn't ask to be blind in the first place. He also didn't even profess his faith as a disciple of Jesus, and yet still, the powers that be blame him for what happened to him. Yet still, they say, you're obviously not telling us the truth, what really happened. They cannot accept what Jesus has done. And so they continue to put the blame for what has happened on the man to whom it has happened. The man who has done nothing to ask for this or deserve this, and yet they put all the blame on him to the point that they put him out of the synagogue. It's obviously his fault, not ours, that this happened. Let's put him out of the synagogue and they revile him. Maybe it's not a perfect parallel, but it's pretty clear to me 
that the blame is going to someone who does not deserve it. Now, thankfully, in our society, we are getting much better about this victim blaming. It is not as predominant as it once was. And a lot of it has to do, I think, with the recent developments in the Me Too movement. Are y'all familiar with this movement? It's gotten a lot of traction lately, but it actually began over a decade ago, in 2006. A lady by the name of Tarana Burke started this. And she started as a grassroots campaign that she described as empowerment through empathy. And as she tells the story, it began when one day a 13-year-old sexual assault victim tells her what happened to her. She said at the time she didn't know what to say. But later, she wished she had just said to the 13-year-old, Me too. Empowerment through empathy. Well, thanks to social media, it's really caught on in the last little time here. It has really caught on, and, and I don't know about y'all, but it has really opened my eyes. It has opened my eyes to a culture of sexual assault. It has shocked and surprised me, not only that these things are happening, but then it made me look at my own self, and I'm shocked and surprised the way I have participated in that culture. About all of the times when I naively thought, oh, that behavior's okay. But all of the times when I look back and realize even my own behavior was far from acceptable. <clears throat> it is an eye-opening experience. In the gospel, Jesus empowers the man who is the victim, the man who has been blamed. Now, I don't think he's a, a victim of sexual assault, but he is definitely a victim of bullying. He is definitely a victim of the powers that be trying to make him into something he is not at their own whim and at their own fancy. And it is Jesus then who comes in and empowers him and says, no, you are the one who can see. They are the ones who are blind. Like I said, I think our society is moving to a much better place in regards to no longer victim blaming and in regards to opening our eyes to believing those who really are victims. But there's still a lot that we can do. And this text reminds me that there's a lot that we can do as a church. This text reminds me that when someone was being abused, Jesus stepped in, didn't blame him, and despite his actions, or despite the actions that were placed on him, empowered him and lifted him up. What might be the role that we as a church can play? Amen.